70 kilometers per hour. Um, the front wheel exploded and I face planted. My face was unrecognizable and I basically had six months of rehab after that. So it was mental and physical scars. But coming back to the, the why, um, that was really important. Asking myself, do I really want to do this? Is this, is this really the pathway that I want to? It comes back to strength and resilience, but I think yes. underlying that, you don't have that, that real strong sense of your why, then it's mm. difficult to be resilient on top of that. Today, I'm with Rachel Nalen, Olympian and professional road cyclist. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much for joining us through this series. Thank How you. Are you. It's lovely to be here. I'm very well. I'm, uh, I'm coming in hot from uh, altitude training camp in Tenerife up at 2,200 metres. So, uh, wow. It's been a, a tough couple of weeks, but I'm almost at the end of it. So, yeah, it's nice to do something different <laughs> for a morning. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it is a rest day, so I'm um, yeah, I'm happy to happy to be here and um, to share some to share some thoughts and words and um, and to share a morning with you all. We're so excited to have you a part of these series. Um, you know, we I've been interviewing women that are in the corporate world, but to be able to interview you as a professional athlete. You know, it's something so different. And I know you've been a client with Nexia for about eight years you mentioned eight years and they've been able to support you right. with your with your tax and you know being such a unique brand as an individual and a sole trader so it is great to have you here tell us a little bit about your profession as a professional road cyclist what does that look like what does that mean well, essentially, as an Australian um, professional road cyclist, like all the racing happens over in Europe. So we mm -hmm. essentially have to be based um, in Europe for, for 10, nine, 10 months of the year. The season goes from um, late February, early March until the, um, the end of the World Championships, which is normally the, the last weekend of September. Um, so October is the off season, the, uh, the, the holiday month, and then um, it starts already back again, the, the winter preparation in November, um, December, January. So normally I come back to Australia for, for a couple of months over, over Christmas and summer to spend time with family and we had some domestic racing in January. Um, yeah. So it's pretty full on year round. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been my life and I've gotten, I, I've, I've gotten pretty, yeah, I've gotten used to it the last, um, yeah, the last eight, 10 years or so. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a life that I've, um, I've come well accustomed to not being in one place for a very long, very long time. <laughs> of course, yeah. So did you always know that you wanted to be a cyclist or and, you know, from that uh, participate within the Olympics? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I actually, I started out as a, um, as a wide-eyed 10-year-old watching the Olympic Games and I, my first Olympic memory was Barcelona and Kathy Watt winning the gold medal. Oh, wow. And I had absolutely no idea what cycling was. Cycling wasn't in my family. Okay. Um, I hadn't even started sort of doing competitive sport at that, at that age. Um, but my brother started Little Athletics and so I got dragged along and I just got there the first meeting and I said mum can I do this too please this is all I want <laughs> so it was something that was just clearly um innate and it was a it was a real um it was it was such a, a driving force for those for those younger foundational years and I just loved my little athletics and I I went you know I'd, I'd do everything to make sure that I could go to my training sessions and I did little athletics all through my teenage years and through my early twenties. And it just, it wasn't until my early twenties that I realized I was essentially barking up the wrong tree and just athletics, it wasn't going to get me that green, that green and gold track suit. So I came to that realization uh, in my early twenties and, um, and then sort of started the next phase of, of my life with university and study and, and my sports physiotherapy profession, thinking that I could satisfy my, Olympic desires of being a, a physiotherapist. Right. Very different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So tell me, when was that defining moment for you when you realized that you could be more, you could do more, and 
you could actually achieve your dreams or go after it. Yeah, well, I guess I, I, I call it the, the, um, the ignition or the tipping point in my mm. life. I, I was, um, I, I, you know, I, I, went to, um, I went to university straight out of school and, and worked hard, studied hard. Um, you know, it was a, a sort of um, something clicked in, in my late teens and I just, I, I had this incredible work ethic and, and, mm. and drive to sort of do things well and succeed. So I worked quite hard at school. I wasn't naturally intelligent or, um, but I, I was able to really execute this extreme work, work ethic and, and right. do these long study days and I was able to get quite a good um, result at the end of my school. I just shocked the pants off my <laughs> whole family actually. Because right. it wasn't something that came naturally. Um, so, I, so I got straight into physio, did, um, did physio for four years and then um, straight into my profession. And because I had a lot of contacts through my athletics, I was able to um, get accelerate my work experience into the sports arena and start right. to work with some um, fantastic sporting organisations um, like the Sydney Swans. And then I ended up wow. starting to work with a lot of, um, uh, with New South Wales Institute of Sport and then uh, the AIS and Rowing Australia and I got into rowing um, as a physio because I had started to dabble in the sport of rowing through an ex-boyfriend so there's all yeah. these little links in the chain that, that, <laughs> that, that, that lead to this journey which is it's something that um, I'm sure a lot of people can relate with you know those those conversations those decisions that lead you to where you are which you can and then you get trace back and it's just it, it seems incredible at yeah. the time. Yeah. yeah. And then you get and, those um, little sparks. Think, how did that all just, how did that all, how did that all happen? <laughs> um, so the ex-boyfriend um, convinced me to start, to start rowing and I tried rowing and that um, was really the tipping point to make me realise that I wasn't just a one-dimensional track athlete mm -hmm. and that I actually did have potential to transfer my athletics skills and my athletic physical abilities into something else so that planted the seed of of thought and idea that I could be more um athletically and I could transition and there was a few other people a few other women who started to transition from rowing to cycling or uh, cycling to rowing and I, I sort of watched that and I started to bank all these uh, impressions in my mind and ask a lot of questions and speak to a lot of people um, and also, and then coupled with my knowledge of physiology, sports science, and what I was yeah, studying cool. at university. Um, so there was all these things that am amalgamated to, to me being able to, I guess, um, do, do research and become um, educated in uh, not only my physio profession, but what I was about to do athletically, which was um, go from being a runner and then, you know, dabbling in the, in the rowing and then back yeah. to the running. Uh, and transform my body into into becoming a cyclist. So it's a, it was an in, interesting journey, but the tipping point was firstly that that experience of um, of learning to row, of, of of trying the rowing for a year, yeah. Um, and then the experience of being a physiotherapist uh, in Europe, travelling, you know, with my green and gold track suit, but being <laughs> on the other side of the fence. And after that. Uh, those few months it was before Beijing it was 2007 and yeah. they were winning medals left right and center and I was working with some of Australia's top um, top athletes and they were winning world championships wow. um, and I was this tw young 25 year old physio on the other side of the fence thinking I've got a lot of these attributes that these not not in an, not in an egotistical way but I I could resonate so much with what these athletes were doing. Yeah, the only right. thing was I realised that I hadn't found my, my perfect physiological match. And, and I realised that at the end of that rowing trip, I realised um, it, it's now or never. You know, mm -hmm. I need to, I can be a physio forever. I can be a physio when I'm 50. But right now is the window of opportunity for me to find my physiological match in sport and give you know it's just one window of opportunity and I need to give everything yeah. um, and so that was 
that was that was a real tipping point was um was that international rowing trip in 2007 uh-huh. where I was wearing the green and gold track suit on the other side of the fence <laughs> What what did it feel like for you when you realised that road cycling was your that was your sport for your body? And explain explain that that feeling that you got that knowing. Yeah, I guess um, I don't know whether it was a knowing straight away. Like um, mm-hmm. it was re- it it was scary because you know you have to um, there's risk involved. You have to deal with cars and traffic on the road, and there's yeah. Like, you know, riding fast down hills and all these kinds of things. Um, and there were, you know, there were crashes in the early days. Like it didn't go full smooth, smooth sailing. <laughs> it's not like I just picked up a bike and said, oh, I'm going to become a professional cyclist in Europe and pop, you know. Um, but it was just the excitement and the, the feeling of embarking on this big challenge, mm. but equipped with the knowledge and experience that I had behind me and my profession, my degree, and that knowing that I had that security to go back to that job whenever, um, well, actually, in the first few years, I was still working part-time, obviously, like, I, you know, you can't just go from <laughs> being a physio to being a professional blacklist. To That's like that. Salary. So, um, <laughs> so I worked part-time, yeah, I worked. No, no, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. No. Um, so I moved from one one of the enabling things in my journey was that I'd made this decision to move from Sydney to Adelaide and that mm-hmm. enabled me to just strip back my life. No more shoes and handbags, no more going out and partying in Sydney. You know, I left my inner west um, apartment with my friends, packed up everything and moved to Adelaide. Wow. So Adelaide was very much back then, um, you know, 2008, very much small town. You know, it was very, very cheap to live and I got a part-time job where I could just live and um, survive off, you know, working um, 18 hours a week mm. as, a, as, as a physio part-time. Um, yeah. So that was a really enabling factor that enabled, that allowed me to just make that jump. And then the first few years were just sort of domestic foundational years, learning the craft, um, surviving, and, uh, and just building that base. Um, base fitness and those base skills so it was really my internship (laughs) yeah yeah of course so what was it for you like you mentioned that you tried various different sports you were rowing you were running and as you know a physio you you felt that it just didn't match for you so there was a few different changes through that period until you got to where you are now what was it like for you going through those changes? Did any kind of fear come up for you? And how did you manage that? Yeah, absolutely. I think fear is a pretty normal human phenomenon. And mm-hmm. if you don't have fear, then I think you're not pushing your own boundaries. And, uh, and I think it's a really important, um, we are wired to feel fear. We are wired biologically to respond to adversity or respond to sort of threat. Yeah. So, you know, if you take it back to you know thousands of years ago when we were doing very different things as human beings, we still had uh, we still had to cope with fear. It was just maybe that there was a you know we were running from a you know a beast in the forest and we had to get to safety. So um, we are biologically wired to cope with that, and I think yeah. that that's important to realise that what the real fear is and what the what the not so real theories and differentiate between what you need to give your energy to and what you don't need to give your energy to, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so differentiating the, the, the types of fear. But I think, I think for me, it was knowing that, um, knowing my why and knowing mm-hmm. that, um, that what I was doing was deep to my purpose. And yeah. I had that feeling, just that insatiable, indomitable desire in, in my stomach that changed and and I felt fulfilled. Um, it wasn't like I'd, I'd made it, but I, I knew I was totally on board with my decision um, to move from Sydney to Adelaide. Like, I mean, that was the defining moment essentially um, where I you know, left my career ambitions behind. And, and the fear just became, it became, 
I guess it was more like it was more like risk and boldness that I embraced right. that and I owned it I owned it and I would but there was a lot of excitement on the other side that really that overtook that a lot of times um yeah, yeah. and if you can delve a little deeper with how to identify whether it's a real fear or it's just something that's you know kind of just occupying our mind but it's not it's not that real type of fear explain that to us well um i, I you know i'm not a psychologist so I'm not yeah. <laughs> but i think you know in my journey i have dealt with a lot of um a setback and a lot of adversity and mm. um a lot of fearful moments and um i mean there is you know with road cycling and with um you know sports that involve high speed or high risk like skiing or motorsports or cycling um there is real fear because um things happen accidents happen and um you need to yeah like that there's definitely a different differentiation with that as opposed to um fear of not being liked or not being um good enough or not winning or you know those um that chatterbox that goes through your mind and, yes. and that's something with um like stilling stilling your thoughts using meditation and um mm-hmm. just having time I, I think away from um media away from stimulation away from other people just to really reset and know know who you are talk to yourself like just listen to yourself and um and just and understand that those fears often come from just that irrational like speedy thought process that just keeps going in your head and just sometimes it just needs to be shut off yes (laughs) put the flick that switch off (laughs) it's easier said than done but i think that um that some little bit of stillness in the life is the key to that yeah and definitely continually practicing that to switch it off and knowing, as you mentioned, the difference between what is that real fear and what are the fear, what's the fear through the, the thoughts that we have and continually training our mind that it's just a thought, it's not actually yeah. truth. And I love the fact that you mentioned, um, you know, meditations helped you with that because that's such a beautiful way to train your mind through that. Yeah, absolutely. So before we move on to the next question, I was wondering if you could share your why with us. My why? Oh, um, <laughs> I, yeah, like I said, I just had this insatiable desire since, since, since the age of 10 to mm. become a world-class athlete. Um, and it, it's a why, it's, it's to discover my utmost human potential um, wow. as an athlete. Um, but also my bigger why, and and why I was able to, um, I guess, move on to the second. That was that was my instigation. Why and now mm. my why has has become. Yeah, I still want to achieve my utmost human potential, but I have, I guess, ambitions to want to um, inspire other other women and inspire yeah. especially young women to become um, physically um, healthy. I guess healthy, fit and strong. Yeah. And that's so aligned with International Women's Day's uh, their theme this year. So it's choose to challenge. And at next year, we're saying, you know, choose to challenge yourself. And it is, I mean, it's imperative that we do challenge ourselves in everything that we do. And of course, you've definitely done that throughout your career. Share with our audience, what are, the, what are some of the steps that you followed to get to um, your level of success to where you are up until this point? I think, um, like, I, like I said, those vital steps in the, in the chain um, was boldness, risk-taking, um, yeah. that, that, de- that decision that, I, you know, it took a while for me to come to the decision, but I didn't ponder over it for years and, years and months. Once I had all the information I gathered, it was an I guess an educated, um, educated risk, yeah. <laughs> educated yeah. risk, risky decision. Um, <laughs> but that bold, that boldness and, and the willingness to just go all in. And I say throw the kitchen sink at it, which is exactly what I did. Yeah. Um, and and that was that that willingness to let go of my ego, let go of my professional mm-hmm. career, and not wanting to have 
both, not wanting to have, um, I was willing to give away my sports physio career and these fantastic jobs that I was getting in, you know, touring the world as a sports physio for my true dream, passion, desire, which was to become an Olympic and world class athlete myself. Um, so that is, was, that's one of the, the big things is like to go all in. Um, and I know a lot of people talk about balance and that's, that's great. Obviously you need, you need balance, but I, I don't believe you can be the best in the world or uh, on the world stage at anything if you're trying to do two things, um, at, you know, if you're trying to do two big things at once. Yeah. Um, obviously family life and, and personal life comes into it. Um, but that was, that was one of the most defining factors for me. And then just knowing, knowing my why. Um, but I think nothing happens without work ethic. You just okay. have to know how to do the hard work and the heavy lifting and being really, really integral to, to, to my journey and to, um, to my success and my longevity as a professional athlete is the, yeah. is the sheer work ethic that I've been able to sustain. Yeah, brilliant. And, you know, I love the fact that you mentioned, you know, part of your why is to be the best that you can be within performance. And so it's so, so incredible. You, and you have to, to be of your level, you do really have to commit. So yeah, absolutely. Yep, yeah, commitment. And uh, it's 100%. Yeah, yeah. So do you believe in motivation? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. motivation I guess is a word that's thrown around a lot um, mm -hmm. but you know when you strip it back it, um, it comes from the word motive um, and that is you know a need um, to, to it, it's a need um, that ultimately requires satisfaction right. um, and you need to to have, to have motivation, I guess, you know, it comes in, in different, you know, it can come in different ways from mm -hmm. um, consciously, both consciously and like, and, and, and unconsciously. Um, and also, you know, intrinsically, extrinsically. So it's not sort of one dimensional. And I think for people, it doesn't come, doesn't necessarily, you know, come easily for certain things. But um, I think you tend to know if you're in the right place if, it, if motivation comes easily but it certainly yeah. is the key to um to you know achieving um something at a high level for a long period of time it's yeah. essential um to have to have motivation to have you know to have that driving that real driving factor and that willingness yeah um to execute day in day out and do you have a team that supports you? And if so, do they motivate you or you motivate them? Uh, I've always been pretty um, intrinsically motivated. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> you're so passionate uh, about what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, uh, you know, my family are so supportive. Um, and then, you know, you, you have your, your coaches, you have your, like, your mm. physio, um, a sports psychologist, uh, and a you know, a nutritionist. So there's all these people around you that um, that affirm what you do, but the the motivation essentially comes from within. Yeah, yeah, of course. What do you think makes a great leader? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, and I think um, leadership, con the concept of leadership, um, is really being talked about a lot, a lot more, and we're yeah. really coming to understand that leadership is not one dimensional. It's not like you know, this person sitting out there calling the shots. And for me to understand that as well, um, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship with the Australian um, Sports Commission to do a women's leadership course, which was Amazing. fantastic. Um, and I did that through um, Ox Oxford University um, mm -hmm. last, uh, in 2000, at the end of 2019. And it was a really fantastic experience in coming to understand the different um, forms of leadership and that you can actually be a leader in your own skin and not every leader is the same and there's no cookie cut out and there's different yeah. forms, different definitely different forms of leadership in all um, walks of life and in all um, in all domains whether it's sport or whether it's you know arts or politics or or um, or in the corporate sector um, yeah so I think 
I think the best type of leadership is a leader that knows who they are and knows um, their own skills, they know, knows their strengths and their weaknesses and is able to um, get the best out of people by getting the best out of themselves. But ultimately, it's someone that leads through humble action and is willing to get on the same level, to listen and to be with their people. Yeah, you've mentioned so many great things there um, as part of, you know, the qualities of an amazing leader. For you, what do you think uh, up and, like, to this point, what do you think has been the greatest lesson as a leader? Well, I've often struggled with that concept. Like, am I a leader? Like, am I doing something that is actually leadership worthy? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because often it's, it's lonely, you know, you're a professional, mm-hmm. you're a professional athlete, you have, I have, I've had, um, you know, I've raced for multiple teams, but it's not something that, you know, like I don't have a huge high profile with millions of followers. Um, and I know women's sport is growing globally, but it, it definitely hasn't been, you know, an, an, an easy road and, and especially competing overseas, there's a minimal impact, there's minimal opportunity through, um, because we don't have the profiles that, perhaps the, the female footballers um, or, or the swimmers or some of the other female athletes are getting. Um, that, that's a challenge and that's quite sad in a way because I would love the opportunity to share my story uh, further, but it's just the, the geography um, that doesn't allow it so much yeah. in the time zone, to be honest. That's a big, it's a big inhibitor. Um, but getting back to the question, I think um, for me it's, it's sharing my story and allowing other people to to resonate with um, the journey that I've had and yeah. what you know what I continue to do and um, and you know for me if, if I can inspire people to be the best versions of themselves and to become um, their optimal selves and to realize yeah. that you know if you're not being deeply satisfied with what you're doing. Ask yourself why, find your why, dig deep, you know, find your, find your purpose um, yeah. and lead, lead with that. Um, and it's, it's not too late to make a change and it is possible to flip your life and do a 360. It really yeah. is possible. Yeah. Um, you just have to be prepared to go all in. Um, and I think that a lot of people, they want to make a change, but they're not prepared to go all in. Um, yeah. So if that's the kind of leadership that I can portray and exude my, you know, share my passion and enthusiasm for um, life-changing experiences that end up in success or, you know, like um, that, that end up in um, having a beautiful um, achievement on the other side, if I can share that with people, then, yeah, that's an incredibly satisfying thing. Yeah, that's so beautiful. So tell me what, I mean, you've been through so much and you've gone through so many different challenges. What was one of the biggest challenges that you've had and how did you overcome that? Um, Because I'm sure there's many. (laughs) Um, Well, coming in as a rookie and my trajectory was really fast. So I found Mm -hmm. myself on a training camp with the Australian um, women's road cycling development team in 2010 on a training camp on one of the high mountains in Italy, the Stelvio. Um, And at that time I had never really, um, I didn't, I hadn't acquired the skills fast enough to be able to, um, you know, keep up with the other girls going on the downhill at such speeds, at such speeds. And I used the brakes way too much and the, the front wheel um, blew out and I was going wow. about 70, 70 kilometres per hour. Um, <laughs> the front wheel exploded and I face planted. Um, oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, lost consciousness and woke up on the other side of the road and um, there was a team vehicle behind me and I ended up in um, a week in Innsbruck hospital with um complete face um trauma um wow. lost my you know my teeth ended up dying and i had a um a mandible jaw fracture <clears throat> my face was unrecognizable and i basically had six months of rehab after that so it was mental and physical scars wow. um, that i had to overcome mm. but i think that was the first really big um the 
really big sort of brick wall that I had to scramble over and um and but coming back to the the why um that was really important in in um asking myself do I really want to do this is this is this really the pathway that I want um and if I hadn't known that if I hadn't been true to that then I wouldn't have got through that that adversity so I think um yeah, I think it just comes back to it comes back to strength and resilience. But I think yes. underlying that you don't have that that real um, strong sort of sense of your why, then it's mm. difficult to be resilient on top of that. If that makes sense. Yeah, of course. I mean, that would have been pretty crazy to experience and go through. It was pretty traumatic because it felt like that this sport was, you know, I'd given so much and I'd, just, mm. I'd put so much energy into embarking on this journey and then to land on my face, like literally, <laughs> um, and to have my face destroyed, it was, yeah, it was really, um, it was an extraordinary thing to have to deal with, yeah. Yeah. I, I was so, so strong about my why that mm. the um that the work and the rehab that i that i needed to do to overcome it to do all the rehab um to overcome the fear um you know to live with <laughs> my face lacerations and the you know yeah. the swelling coming down and um that yeah you know, it was enough it was enough um because i knew that i'd made such a big decision life changing decision and i had already had a taste I'd had a taste of being in Europe and racing in Europe. Yes. And, and I knew that I was on the, on the pathway. So I guess it's, it's, it's seeing the signs and, and seeing the, the doors that are opening and weighing up, you know, do I, is, is my tank full enough to, to, to help carry me, carry me through this? Yeah, and then you, you mentioned that, you, you know, you had that taste of it. So, of course, that fires inside your body. You know exactly what you want. And so you, won't, you will stop at nothing to, to get it back. That's so inspiring. <sighs> so tell, tell our audience your biggest risk. I know you mentioned earlier, you know, there was a risk in, in changing your career and, um, you know, finding out what sport worked best for your body. Explain what the biggest risk was for you. I think I, uh, I think it's just letting go of that financial and social sort of community. Um, being in one place, you know, having that um, consistency and um, and that sort of security. I, I think the biggest risk is letting go of that security because if you if you jump in the deep end and want to become a professional athlete or you know a um you know anything that involves that 100 percent focus and that can involve you know moving around the world or living in another place um that where you are detached essentially from where you grew up and where you started your life um yeah you know it's, it's a challenge um but i think it's it's like it's worth worth overcoming if you're prepared to um put, i guess asking yourself what like what what are your life priorities Right. Um, right. And I and I knew that financial gain wasn't my life's biggest priority. Mm. So I was prepared to sort of put that put that aside. Um, but the other things like, you know, being away from family and mm. um and not having that um I guess the consistency of the you know, the social life and the relationships, that's probably been one of the biggest the biggest challenge. Because that would have shifted quite a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Leaving my friends and family in Sydney, yeah. that, you know, grown up for 25 years and then moved to Adelaide <laughs> and then, um, yeah, but look, you know, I'm still, um, my, some of my best friends are still my studio friends from university. So nothing changes. It's just, um, you know, those, those friendships that you develop from early years that, mm. you know, they're friendships for life and that unconditional love and respect that you have for each other doesn't, you know, your, your pathways deviate, but essentially your souls stay together. So Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. Anytime, anywhere in the world, you know, they'll always be there and you can make those phone calls and see each yeah. other. Like nothing has ever changed. Yeah, it's, I think it's a process of just realising like what, what really matters here. You know, yeah. Is it just to tick, tick the box? And, 
and it was it was a real stark difference in going from Sydney to Adelaide and yeah. you know in Sydney you find like you're running around and you're meeting other people's needs and you're filling up your calendar with all this meaningless stuff but what really mattered to my life was to go all in and to pursue my dream and and stripping back I guess all the periphery enabled me to really do that and it yeah. look on the other on the flip side that it meant that there's a lot of been a lot of solitude um, I wouldn't call it loneliness, but there is a lot of detachment from those normal, stable, secure relationships yeah. and secure environments that you that you're used to growing up with. Um, yeah. So I guess it's just that the and boldness to go into those un in insecure environments. Yeah, of course. And what was your within your career up until this point? What has been your proudest moment? Uh, absolutely. Um, two moments was yes. in 2012, um, winning my silver medal at the world championship. And, yes, of course. Yes. Um, yeah, that was probably one of the most incredible <laughs> race days of my life. And then standing on the podium and seeing that Australian flag wow. rise up, it was um, extraordinary. And then uh, racing um, the Rio Olympics in the green and gold. Yeah. Oh, Putting yes. on my putting on my Olympic uniform for the first time and then racing that, that road race. Um, it was an extraordinary feeling and something I'm, yeah, eternally um, proud of. Smiling from ear to ear, I'm sure, absolutely beaming. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, have you ever struggled with lack of self-belief or struggled with any kind of lack of confidence through the actual races or leading up to competing within the competitions yeah absolutely like <laughs> often people think often people think that athletes are robots you know we're not um it takes a lot a part of being a successful athlete and executing your mm -hmm. your craft is being is to overcome those um those feelings yeah and to like i said before with the fear thing is to differentiate what you know, she did like stuff going on in the like the little monkey mind, um, and stuff that might be real that you have to sort of strategize and and, and work through. Um, but yeah, like I think it's um it's definitely a, a thing that you need to be proactive in in working on um, yeah. and face things as they as they come up, not just push them aside. Um, so it's definitely the, the mental work is, is definitely a big part of being an athlete and a big part of performance. Um, yeah. And I do engage with a sports psychologist to help out with that kind of thing, especially because there are a lot of real fears, like I said, in cycling, mm -hmm. like with, you know, the riding fast in the, in the bunch and the, then the position, the positioning and, you know, we're going at such high speeds riding next to each other and there are crashes and there are downhills and, you know, there is um there's a lot a lot to deal with yeah and it's, it's, it's making sure that you're in that um that good psychological frame of mind to be able mm. to um to be able to deal with those thought processes and that that decision making and not get so emotional during during the race and you can deal with emotions outside the race yeah um, but that's yeah that's definitely one of the biggest and challenging parts is to to deal with those um, peaks and troughs of being an athlete and it's no different from any other human pursuit is that it's normal to have feelings of of, of doubt or I'm not good enough or um, you know was I did I do enough today and and that's that a constant um, striking that constant balance between um, between I guess self affirmations and then like self and then sort of self drive yeah um, and yeah. striking that balance every day with um yeah with that internal thought process of you know analyzing uh what you've what you've done and realizing mm. um coming to that conclusion of yeah was it was it enough and giving yourself a pat on the back um or being straight with yourself and saying no i could have done better so yeah that's being quite guess, honest yeah being honest with yourself i think that striking that balance is one of the um, is one of the key things to being a successful athlete and having good longevity. Yeah. Is to be able to um, be quite 
yeah, be quite strong in that process. Yeah, for sure. And something that happens with all of us, not necessarily if you're a professional athlete, but, you know, through developing our career and our personal life that can come up is imposter syndrome. So have you, has that ever come up for you? All the time. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, (laughs) And especially with like now with social media, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, that's um, enhanced it, it quite a lot yeah I, mm. yeah it's a real thing for professional athletes it's, it's really difficult um and especially like if you're uh, I guess a, a you know a high performing but a lower profile like with, with not having the resources to spend all this money on social media and have right. anyone do it for me um there's a lot of pressure to you know to, to be more and to do more and put out more and just to to be a bigger brand and be better and yeah and um, yeah. and, and that, <laughs> that that can get quite exhausting um so how do you, how do you yeah that? um like i said like i have a sports psychologist that and um i think that concept of having a sports psychologist is a lot more mainstream now um yeah. it's not just a reactive thing it's, it's actually part of your performance um uh talking uh, about that and um, I guess just coming back to, um, you know, just stripping it down and keeping it really simple um, and, and knowing that, um, I guess, looking over and respecting your career and knowing, mm-hmm. embracing what you have done and all the little things as well, like the little impacts that you've made that I might have made to other people's lives by infiltrating my story or sharing my words of wisdom or imparting my experience onto younger writers. For them having seen my journey um especially with the depth of women's cycling that's coming up and for me to realize look back and realize those small things as opposed to just you know counting the podiums or yeah you know, um that's something that's really important as well to look outside and look at the ripples that you've made not just the you know the direct impact or, or the, the podiums or the certificates or the, the letters behind your name i love that uh, celebrate the the ripples that have happened because that's what creates the the big achievements through through your life often you don't know often you don't know where the ripples have gone you know yeah so, ah, that's so don't i guess my biggest um words of wisdom to 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 female leaders or not to anyone um is that don't don't ever underestimate the impact that you can make because it goes it can go far and wide. Oh, that's perfect. I love that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned earlier we you actually brought this up. Uh, so the question is, how do you balance your career and your personal life? And you did touch on this earlier that you know it's not really a balance that you have to commit. So I suppose how would you find the time through your crazy training schedule to have Rachel time? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think uh, in my early years, I really, it, you know, it bit me in the bum and I wasn't able to slow down. I was like a bull at a gate and I was yeah. like, more is better, more is better, more is better. But yeah. I definitely, like, like anyone, you know, you learn through your craft, you become better and you become stronger and you know, you know yourself better and, and you become a lot more efficient and effective at, at what you do. And a lot of that has become the, um, the, the knowing and the realisation that you have to have switch off time and you have to have those, those little pockets of quiet time and um, whether that's, you know, after coming back from a race is just like shutting off and, um, you know, not having any, sort of, uh, um, you know, just scaling back the human interaction for a day yeah. or two. And, <laughs> Going to the beach by myself, having a day off, um, going into you know going into nature. I mean, my 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 job, my profession involves being in nature every day, cycling mm-hmm. on the road. Um, but you know, to to just um, trust your gut instinct, and when you're when you are feeling tired and exhausted of putting energy out, you need to refill the tank and put energy back in. Yeah, yeah. And with that, I mean, I suppose, you, you know, when you do, when you do have that time to relax or take that day off, it helps you to really, to recharge and your performance levels increase. Yeah, absolutely. So I generally work in like a, you know, three day blocks and then mm. we have 
um, three or four day block of hard training and then have an easy day, whether that may, might just mean, you know, just a one hour training ride or just something just to get the legs going. And then after lunchtime, it's like switched off. So yeah. I try to not think about cycling, not look at cycling <laughs> um, and really, really do something that just allows my mind to, um, to rest and just yeah. to recharge those, those deeper energy levels. And that's just something that's, um, fundamentally important for you know to keep going otherwise if you don't recharge and refill the, the mental and emotional tank you um, you don't have that sharpness to be able to, to go back in full swing right. the next day or for the next for the next few days so I think it's really relevant to anybody who's in a high performing um, job that you need to have those pockets of time um, mm -hmm. Whether it's when you come home from work or whether it's on the weekends, it's to really, really switch off. Yeah. 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 I love being out in nature. We've been quite busy with International Women's Day campaign and all the interviews and those sorts of things. And the other morning, I woke up earlier than usual and I just went down to the beach, had a swim, and came out. And it was like, quite honestly, you know, the reborn again, having all of that energy through the day makes such a difference to take that break and to rest yeah so, absolutely and some, sometimes it can be rest but sometimes it can be exercise like yeah you, you might feel might feel tired but like you said being going in the water and having that uh, you know energizing feeling of moving your body in nature can sometimes give you the energy you need mm. do you have a morning and an evening routine yeah generally uh, the morning routine is focused around like the what's the emphasis for that training session for the day so yeah. wake up um have a really good breakfast um you know read the, read the news um and um emails and you know whatever's going on connect with the world a little bit mm -hmm. um but actually be before i do that before i connect with the world and turn my phone on um oh first of all i don't sleep with my phone in my room so oh i, I love no that <laughs> no device i have a no device bedroom yeah. um, and then I don't, I don't turn my phone on until, you know, 10 or 15 minutes after I've woken up and I've put, um, uh, I've, get, I've made myself a cup of tea, I normally have tea first, and then I don't hit the coffee until, uh, you know, like at least sort of 45 minutes after I've, or an hour after I've woken up. Um, and then, yeah, my coffee machine is a big, my rocket coffee machine, my espresso machine is a big part of my morning. What, what um, coffee do you drink? What coffee do you make yourself? Uh, I normally I normally like just a, a double espresso or like a, a sort of short, long black. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or if, if I've got a good oat milk, then I'll make a little like oat milk macchiato. Oh, um, right. So yeah, breakfast is a big focus. So fuel mm -hmm. up for the training session for that day and then prepare my uh, water bottles, my drinks, my training, nutrition, whatever I need, um, my clothes, um, whatever temperature it will be, like sunscreen or whether it's like lots of winter clothing for the training <laughs> session, um, make sure my bike's ready to go. And then I will do my um, activation exercises, which is just um, like a 10 minute routine just to get my muscles fired up. Mm. And then I go out on my bike, go training. Um, and then my evening routine, I just try to switch off um, with something, with some, um, yeah, some, something calming, you know, watch, um, I try not to be doing, you know, emails or um, any kind of work after okay. dinner time. Yeah. Yeah, and use a bit, a bit of a switch off and then um, wind down, tend to like, you know, dim the lights and just sort of like wind the system down um, yes. uh, after dinner time. And then, yeah, yeah, try not to be on the phone. There's <laughs> <laughs> a phone downstairs and then I'll read um, from my Kindle, which has got like no blue light. So it's just, um, yeah, it's just the, the, the black and white Kindle. And, yeah. and then that normally puts me to sleep. So, yeah. <laughs> what are you reading at the moment? Um, I'm reading Beneath the Scarlet Sky. It's a it's a book about um, a, a young 18 year old like in the um, in the Second World War, an Italian guy that ends up be, becoming a, a spy for the Germans. Um, oh, wow. 
Yeah, yeah, it's really, uh, I've just I've almost finished it, but um, yeah, it's a fantastic read, yeah. Oh, amazing. <laughs> I'll add that to my list. It's a true, yeah, it's a true story. It's, it's, it's educational, but it's also, um, obviously, it's of interest to me because I, I live in Italy, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, as mentioned earlier, we're running these interviews as part of International Women's Day. So tell us, who are the women in your life that inspire you? Oh, there are just absolutely so many. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the, current, the current environment at the moment, the women um, you know, that come to mind, first of all, are not even women, female athletes. Like the, the four females who were Australians of the year, I mean, they're mm-hmm. extraordinary, all in their, own, in their own right and learning from the best stories is just, you know, the, the courage and the determination to um, inspire and, um, and bring to light their journeys for the good of other people and for the next generation. I think that's quite extraordinary. Yeah. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the female politicians that are leading the world at the moment. Um, yes. <laughs> Jacinda Ardern and, you know, and Angela Merkel, like the, the German, she's just, who's just um, stood down from her, I think, like 18 years or something. Wow, yeah. Um, I mean, look, I can't single out any, any, um, any female leader at the moment who is, is better than the other. There are just yeah. some really extraordinary women who we... I mean, they've been extraordinary women all along, but I think <laughs> we're just... We're just uh, we have the medium to, to be able to bring... Um, to be able to bring them... Uh, to people's attention more yeah. Um, but yeah look in terms of in terms of athletes um I uh, there are yeah there are some tr- Kathy Freeman was one of my biggest yeah. idols growing up um yeah. Debbie Flintoff King who won a gold medal not many people know who she was but I had a poster of her on my bedroom <laughs> door she, she she won a gold medal in the 400 meter hurdles which no one had ever done no Australian had ever done before um, and then Lane Beachley, who's a uh, Australia's um, most re- well-renowned female surfer. She's got an ex- yeah. extraordinary story, and um, and she's gone through some incredible things to to be a trailblazer for women's surfing. So, yeah, there's quite a few there, but um, I'm I'm not one to single out. I think that there's some extraordinary women, women Australian women, um, who are there to share their stories for. Um, not only for young up and coming women, but for, mm-hmm. for, for all of us. Yeah. I think that's a common thing, a uh, common theme that a lot of the women that I've spoken to, there's not one particular one. They, they actually name quite a few women that. In- yeah. Like I think even like Oprah, someone like Oprah, she's, mm. she does extraordinary things, you know, because she brings, she uses her position of power to bring good to other people's lives. Yeah. By, by, by um, showcasing all these incredible interviews and human stories. Yeah. So the next question, I feel like I already know your response, so I'm going to see if I'm correct. On a Saturday at 10 a.m., where would we find you? Well, it's a good question because it depends on the time of year. So okay. If it's, if it's, if it's during <laughs> the season, then it's whatever – um, it's like I don't have like a seven day week it just revolves the training schedule is sort of on a on a revolutionary cycle yeah so it could be um, if it's a day on then 10 o'clock is normally nine it depends if it's summer or winter but um, nine ten o'clock is definitely time I'll be on the bike yeah um, if it's winter then I'll be just sort of I start the ride around about 10 o'clock because it's pretty cold in Europe before that time. Yeah. Um, but if it's a rest day, well, then I might be at a coffee shop or yeah. a, a farmer's market. Um, but if I'm in Australia and I, if, and if it's a rest day, I might be at the beach with my family. Um, but, yeah, probably more. I was more I, than not be on the bike. I was partly right. <laughs> So this is leading us to our last question. So let us know um, what advice would you have for the women out there who are dreaming 
big, whether it's taking that next step in their career, apply for, you know, that senior leadership role as a director, um, or even going after that CEO or stepping up into their own business or their own consultancy business, what advice would you have for them who, you know, are, they know, they know their dream, they want to go after it, but there's that just little bit of fear that's there to, to get them over that edge. I think um, my biggest words of advice for women wanting to, um, wanting to succeed, to succeed um, and to, to lead and to, to fulfill their potential is mm. know your why and don't be afraid to ask yourself the big questions. Mm. Work hard, be prepared to know what it takes and to go all in with that extraordinary work ethic because honestly, it's, there's no easy way to the top. It doesn't happen. If you read any, if you delve into any stories of the world's top high performers in whatever domain, yeah. hard work is the bricks and mortar, it's fundamental. Um, and then have resilience and persistence um, because that you're always going to come up against hurdles. It's never going to be smooth sailing and you need to be able, that resilience is so important to be able to withstand um, you know, the peaks and troughs of, of what's thrown at you and the challenges. Mm. So those are the three, the three biggest things. Know your why, have the work ethic, and then build that resilience to be able to withstand the storm. Oh, that's amazing. Rachel, thank you so much for your time today and to be a part of these series. We really appreciate it. And, you know, hearing your words and the things that you do and you've done in your career and the challenges that you've been through and overcome. It's just such an inspiration. And honestly, I think, you know, you've been such a true example of going after your dreams committing, as you just mentioned, those three key things, you live that. Um, so we really appreciate for you to have you here and to share your wisdom with our audience. Let What is next for you? Well, um, I, it's, um, it's certainly probably the last or second last year of my racing career as a professional road cyclist in Europe. Uh -huh. um, but obviously the pandemic has thrown a spanner in the works and yeah. um, last year the, <laughs> the Olympics was cancelled. So this year um, I'm, I'm full steam ahead with um, my ambition for Tokyo selection. So I'm in a pretty important period of time at the moment and, uh, yeah. and which is Olympic selection time. Um, so, yeah, fingers well, crossed that, um, yeah, it's only a small team. It's only four road riders for the Australian women's team. So it's, it's quite, um, it's, it's definitely a hard ask, but um, mm. I'm, not, I'm not holding back and I'm not leaving any stone unturned. You're going all out for it and we, all of us will be cheering you on. Thank you so much. Thank you <laughs> yeah, so much. It's been a real pleasure that. to share my story and with you and um and to chat with you this morning so yeah appreciate it yes it's your morning our evening <laughs> yeah my morning <laughs> where where are you in um in italy well i i live in uh, luca in tuscany okay. yeah um but at the moment i'm on training camp up at altitude over in the um the canary islands in tenerife and oh, wow. uh, it's one of the high it's one of the highest points in um the highest altitude points um, with a hotel on top that you can stay for yeah. sort of some extra sort of altitude benefits. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when do you when do you find out about um, making the team? Well, we still have selection races over the next two months, so okay. I need to perform. Amazing. To put all these words into action. <laughs> <laughs> Which I have no doubt you'll do, and we again will all be cheering you on. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. And good luck and uh, all my best wishes to all.